¿Qué tal? ¿Cómo están? Bienvenidos. Hi, good evening. Welcome to each one of you to this special program called Agenda. Today we're broadcasting from Panama, from the city of Panama, an extraordinary program from an extraordinary country, which is the bridge between different oceans. And it's a very good example of how Latin America is growing and growing a lot. From this point forward, we're going to see what the inconveniences are, the difficulties that the entire continent can have facing the future when the situation is as complex as it is in the world. Panama is an extraordinary example. It's a city that when you land, you feel like you're in Manhattan, but then you realize that it's actually even better than Manhattan because you can go to the beach and you cannot go to the beach in New York. Today we want to talk about the Latin American resistance with all of this economic issues that are going on, and there are different ones and there are many. The first guest that we have is Katia Abreu. She was the president of the Agriculture and Stock Confederation of Brazil. She was named one of the most powerful women of Brazil. And uh, she knows inch by inch the entire um, territory in Brazil. And right now she's a senator. To my left, I have, well, if Latin America is growing a lot, Panama is growing even more. 7% is the growth of this year, if I'm not mistaken. But if I am wrong, please correct me, Mr. Minister of Finance and Economy. His name is Frank de Lima. Thank you very much for being here. And we also have the president of Coca-Cola of Latin America. Thank you so much for being here, Brian Smith. Uh, accompanying us in this special agenda edition. There are not all politicians in this debate. We also have here with us Ricardo Hausmann, who is the director of the Center for International Development of the Harvard Kennedy School. And he was also a politician. So he knows very well when politicians are saying the truth or not. And so he's going to be paying attention to everything they say. And finally, we have a minister of a very important country like Mexico. Mexico is a bridge among continents, that is, North America and South America. And this is Mr. Idelfondo Guajardo Villarreal, Secretary of Economy of Mexico. And uh, it looks like you're doing a very good job in the news, at least that is said. We are streaming and we have hashtag. Uh, the hashtag is Let em Growth. And you can use this to write questions and comment. And we're going to be broadcasting them to our different guests throughout this very agenda, a very special agenda program. Katia, the only lady here in the group, uh, we're going to ask. We want to give her a special welcome, and now we want to ask Frank de Lima to please begin in the interventions. Minister, Panama is growing a lot, and Panama is an extraordinary country, but trying to project ourselves more. We spoke uh, earlier about uh, growths that were double-digit growths, and now we're talking about uh, um, 3% being the mean in Latin American countries. Does this mean the party's over? Well, I think that the fact that the global economy, after the crisis in 2008, um, and we haven't recovered to the pre-crisis level. In the case of Latin America, many of the economies are based in the export of commodities and are very linked to the performance of China and other Asian economies. And we also see that China is growing 10%. It's not growing 10%, um, and this year, there is a reduction in growth, and this is having an impact in Latin America. In Latin America, the mean growth is about 3,2%. However, with the news from Asia, there is a review of what this growth could be in the region. Panama is not growing 10 or 11 percent, which was what we grew in 2011 and 2012. Last year, it was 8.4 percent, and this year, the estimate is 7 percent. Minister, you mentioned a very important work, which is diversification. For Latin American economies to export other things, things other than commodities. Alfonso, why haven't we done this yet? Why are we tardy? Why are we late to have a diversified economy? Well, without a doubt, it's due to the nature of the connectivity within a region. In the specific case of Mexico, Mexico is inserted in the global level 
uh, with the free trade agreement of North America, for example, when we pay attention to this phenomenon, Mexico had a market concentration in exportation, which was more than 90% with North America. From that point forward, we have signed 10 treaties with 45 countries, which have given us access to a more diverse demand. But without a doubt, it is still concentrated between Europe and North America. The developed world has a greater impact in terms of the external engine of the Mexican economy. So after the crisis of 2008, we have an impact to the external um, economy of Mexico in an important way. Now, President Peña, from when he began his mandate, he goes towards a diversification strategy. The alliance, the Pacific Alliance gave us a diversity strategy, and this was signed in Cartagena, Colombia on February 10th. The message that is sent with Colombia, Peru, and Mexico uh, as part of the Alliance of the Pacific Alliance, the message is that Latin America is trying to move to a scheme of greater integration. We are negotiating the TPP, and one of the bad news is that out of the 45 countries that we have free trade with, there's only one of Asia, which is Japan, and that is why Mexico is part of the TPP negotiations. And I'd just like to add that free trade is not the only solution. An internal prom uh, policy is key to improve the production performance per countries. One of the lines of the speech is precisely that the internal market into improved productivity seeks to have a better performance within each country. Thank you for the opportunity, exactly. What we're seeing with Brazil is an isolation with respect to these agreements we represent very little when you think about Mercosul. For, for example, Mercosul was a, had good intention of these countries, but really has become uh, an impediment for Brazil to open its doors. Right now, for example, we're working strongly with CNA, which is the Confederation of Agriculture and Industry, both together really getting an agreement with the European Union, specifically because resistance from Argentina. But we believe also that in the case of productivity, uh, even though Brazil has advanced in many sectors, especially in agriculture, because we invested in innovation and technology, we were able to uh, advance in challenges of infrastructure, ports, uh, transport, um, storage, but because of our competitive and looking at inside our rural areas, we've been able to build in the last 40 years one of the largest agricultural sectors of the world. But looking on the outside, we're looking for a revolutionary program of concessions and privatizations, uh, public-private partnerships, because of our small uh, amounts for investment. What I believe is that the free market with the internal conditions of the country, trying to improve our country's productivity, we've increased our port laws, uh, our railways need to get there, they're not there yet. But I'd like to close this first section saying that the most important thing is the strengthening of our institutions, democracy, uh, create uh, a system where investors can feel comfortable. It's really the private sector that brings uh, wealth, not the public sector. To have a good environment, Coca-Cola, is it well positioned in Latin America or better yet, from the point of view of a business person, what could they say to the Latin American government to say, this is what you need to work in? Well, from the perspective of Coca-Cola, we're doing very well in many Latin American countries because we have partners that are local partners. Coca-Cola sells the concentrate 
to bottling companies who then mix it with water and sugar to have the final products. And so when you have local partners that are strong within their own countries, you, in our case, have a big strength to be able to work in the countries. But these local partners, do you work well with them? Or is there a difference? Is there a gap in terms of innovation and productivity and the processes itself? Yes, they do exist. That's what I was getting to. What limits us, perhaps, is what the senator was mentioning. There is a lack of infrastructure, and there is a lot of bureaucracy as well. The, the fiscal system is very complicated, and in the end, for a business person, for many business people, for example, in the case of Coca-Cola, this leads to make our work much harder. And so you use a lot of the resources trying to fight these obstacles instead of using these resources to be more innovative um, or to change. And I think we could have a better balance in pro of the country and also for the benefit of our consumers and to generate more work or labor in the country. Well, in the beginning, when you ta started talking about the concentrates and what you use to make the Coca-Cola, I thought you were going to give us the recipe. Ricardo, in terms of infrastructure, bureaucracy, and fiscal system, from the academic perspective, what can you tell these two ministers that we have here, Panama and Mexico, two very different um, countries with very different economies? What can you tell them? What advice? Well, I think that Latin America is very diverse, and all the countries are facing different difficulties. Mexico is an extremely diversified country. They have carried out their tasks of going into different industries in aerospace and machinery and in different sectors. Mexico's problem is that within the country, there's a state like Nueva León that has a product per inhabitant that is superior than that of Korea. And then you have the state of Guerrero that has one that is lower than Honduras. And so the problem of Mexico is an issue of integration. There's different speeds. You need to integrate the country. In the case of Brazil, there has been a phenomenal luck with the price of commodities. And also, they have that they have a key difference, for example, between Dilma and Lula, the difference is the quality of the successor because the reforms in Brazil were stopped with Fernando Enriquez and all of this boom of commodities has led to this feeling of insatisfaction with the status quo that didn't allow for a progress. And Brazil is not growing. They have not developed the fiscal space for the investment. They have a public investment that is the lowest in the world. But that's not even the worst of the region, because the worst of the region, obviously, is my own country, Venezuela, with the oil barrel at $100. Despite that, the country is going through a catastrophe. This year, we're going to have 100% of inflation, a problem of um, provision that is very severe. And we also have Argentina, which has very favorable external conditions, but they have an economic crisis internally. And so we have generated the capacity of suicide, of just throwing ourselves off the balcony. Well, those of us who are here, fortunately, we're alive. And Frank de Lima is laughing. He says, no, we're not committing suicide. Now, you do mention something that is true, the great diversity of this continent, which makes it really difficult to have common points. But there are numbers that call our attention, which we can work upon, for example, in the issue of education. It's a common point that the investment in education is the basic element so that in the end, these economies are resistant. And it's an investment that is done from 15 to 20 years. And I don't know if the politicals, uh, the politicians that are here are conscious or aware of the importance. Alfonso, the ministers of economy, should they also have an inherence in education? Well, without a doubt, we don't have to be ministers of economy and education, but we do need to be aware of the main common, of the main bottlenecks. 
they're going to require human capital. The most frequent topic that I manage in my dialogues on new investments with national and foreign investors is the availability of engineers and technical experts that are well trained. So in this, that's why President Peña, with this reform, included a reform of education in uh, the key topics of math, physics, and other sciences was very limited, and we had to have a re-engineering. I know that these are very quick messages, but I would like to highlight something. Everything that was mentioned by Ricardo, I am completely in agreement with them. Free trade by itself and economic stability does not guarantee success in Latin America. We have to go to the root of the reform that is required by our systems in order to align everything so that the productivity of the SMEs and the big enterprises are benefited. Imagine Coca-Cola that has all of the elements and they still have complaints. Imagine the small and medium enterprises that don't have those benefits. It's much harder for them. And and education is definitely key. It's true. In Mexico, for example, we're not only talking about students. 75% of professors have problems to pass the test that gives them access as professors. Well, basically, in the Mexican case, you have a labor union that has full acceptance of the reform and a small labor union that represents 10% of the membership that unfortunately is in the states that are lagging behind, which were the ones that Ricardo mentioned. And that is basically one of the problems of the resistance to the educational reform. But the education ministry or the education secretary is firm and establishing evaluation schemes. The other day I was in Mexico and Mexico and, and, the, and New York has the same problems with their labor unions. Um, made up of professors. Is it difficult for you to find qualified personnel in Latin America for Coca-Cola? Yes, it is difficult, and not only engineers, but also I think that we are missing a part that's even more tra basic, training for people that work in factories, for example. In the end, if we don't have good elementary and secondary schooling, it's very difficult to train people for them to be trained or to have the skills for a specific type of job. So it's not just um, from the beginning, it's an entire chain. For example, we're promoting a program that supports women worldwide, training them and offering them job opportunities for their own enterprises. And what we are seeing is that many of these women are lacking basic training for them to be able to manage small businesses. So we're working with that. Now, I think this is work that needs to be done both by the government as well as by the private sector. And I think we should do this in conjunction so that we can train people in different levels. Frank, in Panama is trying to implement an education reform, right? And it's done with the perspective for it to be sustainable throughout time. Or will the government that steps in change it and it's going to be a failed process. Well, the frustrating aspect, despite the boom of economic growth that Panama is experiencing, is that we don't have enough trained people to take advantage of that boom in the different sectors. Finance, in our financial centers, logistical aspects in the port or with the canal, and even commerce. For example, hotels. We have a lack of qualified personnel, people that can speak English and other languages. And although Latin America is a very heterogeneous region, the problems are homogeneous. The lack of infrastructure and education are two key ones that I can mention. And as it has already been emphasized, we've begun a process of an educational reform in Panama. I think that one of the best things that Martinelli did was to name a journalist as Minister of Education instead of someone that came directly from the sector. Why? Well, because she has made it possible for the public opinion to have changed from supporting the labor unions made up by um, teachers and professors that have stopped every effort of having an educational report, uh, reform in Panama. This has happened here and in other countries as well. But because she has great skills in communication, she has um, helped the public opinion understand the importance of having an educational reform and how to make these reforms um, be kept beyond a government. 
You have to educate parents, of course. They are the most interested parties of their children having good education. You have also have to involve the private sector because who is going to guarantee or demand the future governments to keep themselves in the line of the reform is the private sector in connection with the parents. Na verdade, eu concordo com o ministro que a coisa mais importante nessa batalha é a comunicação. É claro que é importante um ministro I agree with the minister. The most important thing is uh, that dealing with this, uh, to do to make this reforms and changes. It's the same problem we have in Mexico as in Brazil. Uh, the um, entrepreneurship, the strength of the unions, in the resistance to meritocracy, um, methods, um, goals. So education in Brazil, for example, we have a, a fair percentual. In relation to the uh, GDP, 7%, I believe that management of these resources not being made adequately, especially with the basic education, starting there with the base of everything, as the name calls it. So we're promoting great agriculture, great success, very low unemployment. However, we also have a lack of um, workforce, especially with regards to specializations. Everybody is working, but no specialization in the workforce. So a long time we intend, we have created in the National Congress, we created under PRESA the uh, gas and oil fund. We're going to invest a high percentage in education, but I think it's not only money. It's the administration and the focus is not proper. There are models in the world to be followed in many different regions, but that's not what we see. There are many sentences, a lot of this course, education is always important, but when it comes to practice, we do not see an evolution. With regards to families, I agree. Families need to be involved. It's very important. If we do a research with the mothers and fathers in Brazil, people in A, B, and E classes, they're going to see that if there are teachers in class, yes, education is going well. But they don't have the habit of uh, questioning of the education their children are receiving. Ricardo. She talks about all these differences, but uh, not many changes are carried out. Do you have the same impression that uh, this is still an issue to tackle for the future also? I think that Latin America has improved in terms of education a lot more than their financial or economic performance. Latin America today, on average, has more education than what the rich countries had in 1960. Latin America has more or less double or triple the p human capital with university studies than what the, the developed countries have or the rich countries had in 1960. And Latin America ha has a per capita income that is less than half of what a rich country had in 1960s. Despite we're working with technologies that are 50 years more advanced. So I think that it's not just an issue of schooling. What companies are asking for are skills. And these accumulate and you earn them in companies, not in schools. What companies and enterprises want are people that have work experience for five or 10 years in their field. And that is not something that is produced through schooling. That is produced through the business sector. And that is why I consider that the emphasis, the emphasis should be in the process of training in Thailand, they have lower schooling levels, but Thailand is exporting cars, electronics, etc. because the companies have trained their workers. So we should have a much greater emphasis within our training processes and understanding that the enterprises are partners of the government in terms of generating the skills that the market demands. You. Well, let me remind the audience that we have a hashtag in internet. It's Latin growth, and you can send your comments through Twitter and also questions. We're also broadcasting the main comments from our special guests. You talk about the parallelism with Asia, and there's another element that I ask myself in terms of equality to be able to understand why can Asia grow and reduce these 
differences in equality, and those levels in Latin America are not reduced. And I'm aiming to you, Minister, because precisely this is a country where the economic growth is very high, but the inequality is growing. In fact, the Human Development Index shows that the country has gone down 15 positions despite the growth. Well, I think that we have to differentiate, for example, the Gini coefficient, which is used to measure inequality. Yeah, but Panama is not doing very well there either. There are countries that are poor. For example, Nicaragua, they have a better Gini coefficient. In the end, I think that it is a matter of generating richness, but giving also the citizens the opportunity for them to have access to that richness. I was talking excuse me, Minister, the Gini coefficient is a way to measure the difference between the poor and the rich, right? Yes, that is correct. It's a matter of generating richness, but also the conditions so that most of the population can take advantage or enjoy this richness. It's not a matter of taking from one to give to the other. It's more a matter of greater richness for the pie to be bigger and to be divided in a more equal manner. In that regard, in Latin America, we have the perception that everyone has to have a university degree. As Professor Hausman mentioned, I think that we have failed in terms of the technical training aspect. For example, in the United States, who makes up the middle class in the United States? These are the blue collar workers, those that work in factories, the carpenters and others. And if we extrapolate this to Latin America, that person is in the middle to low income sector. And so we have to pay attention to these weaknesses. And we also have constant dialogue between the private sector and the academia. The the educational sector to see what the current trends are and also the trends towards the future. So the students are given the skills that they need for the future. In Panama, which are those? Which are those tendencies for the future in Panama? In Panama, we want to be positioned as the logistical hub of the Americas. We have the canal, we have ports, but we have a very basic logistical services, which is just the moving of containers. And we're not adding value to the merchandise that is transferred through Panama. It's 14,000 ships that go through the Panama Canal. And we simply just take one container from one ship and move it to another. And we're not doing anything to transform or to have a downstreaming of that merchandise and for Panama to become a place to have um, mild ensemble and uh, storage. And in the case of Mexico, I would like to make a comment that is aligned with the comments that uh, has been made. The center of the topic, it has to see, see with the productivity. And the productivity of the economy is damaged by an informal sector that is not connected to the technological development, and to finances, and to a series of elements how you can uh, take advantage of the modern issues. And within the six uh, reforms that Mexico is talking about, energetic, education, fiscal, uh, uh, promotes the competitiveness uh, of the economy. The, the consumers are spending 30 percent of their income in um, concentrated markets. They are paying 40 percent of what they are paying according to other international markets. If you have an economy where the services and uh, it's concentrated and where the, there is a distortion of quality and price that impacts the power of uh, acquiring that you have to have markets that work, competitiveness and opportunities. And the other topic is important. All the strategies are important to look at the potential. And the opportunities are very big. And in Latin America, the final result is to an access minor, uh, is minus of the alternatives. And that informality is a to stay because in Mexico, that is the truth. And it called the attention as how it lowers the productivity of the country that regardless of uh, the circumstances. You have to understand 
what do you have to do in politics? For example, the government has built a structure that are the associations of uh, uh, the attention to the public. Uh, to establish the mechanisms, there is an administration cost of the bureaucracy that believe some kind of incentives that they are not very good, no associated, well, like a popular insurance and all the programs that give an incentive to the public. And we, and some of us could disturb, and we make the informality to grow. We have to go to universal services and do not create a distortion in the economy without making a sacrifice of the finances. It is the first time in the reform in Mexico that is included a chapter to give incentive to informalities to say, join us. We are going to help you. You pay uh, zero taxes, and then you have credit and all the additional incentive. A question, do you want to say something? A question that it comes from the hashtag from the Chamber of uh, Commerce. <coughs> this is how is making an influence the, the, the escape of human and resources. So they don't stay here, but they leave the countries. What are they doing? I. I believe that that happens, but what I have seen lately is that also people are coming back uh, at, at, the t at the same time that economies are improving, for example. Uh, the people that come from Latin America from other places in the world, they go to New York and they want to be in banking, they also see that maybe it's not what they thought it was going to be. And now there are opportunities, because we are talking about the bad part, because there are also really good things, too. Those industries and those needs are in the countries, and that's what we're really talking about, the lack of people. There are many people that are coming back to their own countries that they used to be outside, because there are opportunities to work in what they would like to work, and to be within the context where they would like to live. I think that Latin America, one of the things that uh, is more suicide in themselves, as we say, is precisely in to attract the global talent. I work at the Harvard University, and I am surrounded by teachers, professors. Uh, born in the ones born in the United States are is a minority. The Harvard would not be Harvard if it was full of people uh, born in the United States. The majority of the University of Latin America, they are full of people born in their own countries. I think that that's not necessary, and it's a, a big mistake, because the talent generate uh, sons, children. When we bring a talent talented person that is going to attract others in Latin America has the possibility to take advantage of the, 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 the crisis of uh, Spain and Portugal. This crisis has, uh, for example, in the decades of the 30s and 40s, the United States got, got all those talents from the, uh, Europe, and then they, uh, they won the, the Nobel Prize. Latin America has, at this moment, the opportunity to attract, to absorb talent. But our immigration laws, our labor laws, are preclude to take advantage of those opportunities. As I mentioned, it, we have a lack of qualified labor. And in order to fulfill that demand in the market is uh, precisely to make the uh, immigration flexible, so professionals from certain uh, careers and in a list of about 40 countries like Spain, Argentina, can come to Panama in 30 days. They would have their working permit. What we have done also in order to uh, fight the informality is to legalize the foreign people in Panama so in a, in a uh, low cost, so those people can always have the right to have a working permit. They can have the, the, the medical insurance and continue working legally. You are welcome to come. We are 
Just to reinforce the comment of Ricardo and from the minister, President, President Peña had a meeting with four important presidents of um, technology, IBM, and all the important ones. And the recommendation number one for to decide uh, policies it was to make flexible the policies. And that it was also very, uh, they criticized uh, Washington and to, to bring uh, talents from. It. So when we ask, what do we do in Mexico in order to attract these people, the number one was to have flexibility in immigration. We are also talking about uh, 100 million of uh, younger people, that, so it has a great potential. Thank you. I would like to also compliment thinking about China. For example, there are certain areas of ex export that have this function, some special spaces that brought industries from other places and special specialists to bring the know-how to this country. And they're going to take advantage of this opportunity. In Brazil, we have a very interesting project that was created by the federal government, which is Science Without Borders. We are sending our youngsters, and also professionals, not just young adults, doing specializations all over the world. We have had a very good acceptance in certain countries. We're having one difficulty, language. Few Brazilians speak English and uh, German, but the program is incorporating language learning. And what we're doing is a partnership with the private sector and government in a program called Promatec. And we have already educated three and a half million uh, youngsters from uh, high school before they go into college in agriculture, in certain indus industry, commerce, and transportation. And it has had a very extraordinary effect. Uh, government uh, provides the resources, but it's the public, uh, the private sector that actually provides the training. Uh, is Latin America ready to, uh, for the Chinese people, with less Chinese, or with less dollars brought by the Chinese people? I think that in Mexico we have got to this point without the Chinese people. We are re-engineering this. And a year, it's a year ago, the president visited uh, visited China, and we have established a relationship between uh, Mexico. The relationship was uh, characterized by the conflict, and when we we bought 57 million, and we only sell them 7 million, we have to balance that, and 92 percent are uh, commodities that is um, to export uh, part of those commodities. We we are in a new phase how to make negotiations together. And basically, I believe that, that we have to take advantage of Ch China according to what they have. I think that Latin America are separated between Central America and Mexico, and South America by the other side. Mexico and Central America are closer to the export and South America is more important products and believe when China uh, imports and, uh, and South America is more vulnerable to decelerate and China is uh, losing competitiveness and South America there are two major classes the countries that if it is true they are concentrated in commodity they have a macroeconomic capacity with as a case of Chile and Colombia, and there are countries that are in the middle of a boom and very fragile. But it is important that uh, is if something happens in China, then it's going to be a problem. We are almost finishing right now, and it's going to be another round. And then we already we are in family, right? So what is the the following? reform what do we have to do in latin america as together and how, how which one would be for example in two years what should change so the economies in latin america could be a more uh, 
resistant. Uh, basically, I would say that in the case of Mexico, we discovered that the free trade and the uh, financial stability uh, they, they do not really guarantee the prosperity. That is the reason of the package of reforms, energy, financial, education, fiscal, that are fundamentals in order to transform the, the economy, uh, the Mexican economy, and to reach the goals of productivity and would facilitate the access of this productivity to the uh, small and medium businesses. Okay. Very good. From the private and the multinationals, everything that is uh, that Alfonso plus what he said of the informality uh, type and the medium and long term, and it's short uh, term and in, in the middle uh, term, and in a short term we have to do training uh, to as Frank was mentioning, education, 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 and to uh, train uh, the human capital to make, uh, uh, to be our region more productive, more, inno more innovation, we have to change our education system. We also have to think as part of the, the Panamanian. I believe that we have to do the macro uh, homework, but I believe that the region has to have commitment with the diversification, uh, an open diversification, no diversification, uh, talking about Mer Mercosur, that is really a shame. And, and I can see that your opinion is very clear. Otherwise, we have to do our homework. In case of an opening, it has to be a commitment for the diversification, new ideas, new ideas that they are in the world, but we don't have it. As Mexico did, uh, tracking the Bombardier, for example, as it's been done by Costa Rica with Intel to uh, start the market with them, with the idea of the, the city of knowledge, and uh, to bring those to our region. Katia, uh, before that, I'm going to read a comment. It's very important to point out how Latin America should be open to the global talent and diverse. Katia, what, what is your dream within the two years? Con relação ao canal do Panamá, o Acordo Livre de Comércio com a União Europeia. Sorry. Well, we have to say that uh, the economic agreements, they have to be like balloons to bring countries up. But America so has been like an anchor, bringing Brazil down to the end of the ocean. I wanted the uh, logistics to be completed. The Panama Canal is very important for Brazil too, but we're trying to make uh, ref logistic reforms in the country. That's my big, big dream, that we become ready for this free, trade, a protectionist country results in isolation and protectionism. We want to have the same opportunities China, ha China had in order to open our country. It might bring some negative points, but at mid and uh, long term will bring better results. Yes, I'm sure. I will not lose my preguntas tenemos muy pocos minutos, pero probablemente Maybe open the, the, the question period, and first here, and then in the center. Uh, you're going to get a mic. That Cumbers, Espinosa, we have seen something critical of political crisis. How is this making an influence to the world economy and in Latin America? In the case of Venezuela, Argentina, and Brazil, how is this making an influence? And if the private sector has to be here present to dialogue in this uh, political crisis? And Ricardo, I think that you're going to be answered. And uh, Brian, also, you're going to be young. The cost that it represents a crisis in the case of Venezuela. Venezuela has been a fountain, uh, a source of uh, problems for Colombia. Now it's doing that to Panama for the debt that it has. 
and uh, there is an international radiation and uh, policies Latin America has behaving with not being responsible and in the management of the the agreement political uh, agreements uh, in terms of the private sector I believe that we have a responsibility in our case for example in Venezuela we are there for a long term and the political topic uh, uh, although we can continue operating although the situation is very difficult we are uh, doing uh, we're putting capital uh, from outside because otherwise we would not be able to operate. As we are there in the long term, we have to say, well, uh, in the short term is bad, but we do not think in the option of getting out. We are there to stay there, and if they let us work and, and selling our product, we will be in Venezuela. And Brian is uh, president of, uh, for a basic reason, and they are he here. Uh, question right here. Thank you, Oli Martini. I would like to mention two things in the panel, this deceleration of the global economy, and they are uh, proposing to, uh, in order to attract the investment, foreign investment. How do we do for these reforms to, to attract the, the foreign investment or they cannot be confused or could be an excuse to reduce the human rights and uh, environmental rights? What are those measurements that uh, are measured that they should be taken? That Deceleration requires a lot of uh, changes, especially in Latin America. Um, we have an optimistic situation. The United States is finding its balance, uh, actually, in an expected uh, um, speed. Uh, the European Union, not as well as the U.S., but it's also finding its balance. China is still surprised because of the change in its economic drive going from uh, production to internal consumption. We don't know if it's going to work or not. The substitution and the economic drive in China, it does affect us. It corresponds 22% of the Brazilian market above the European Union, which used to be our most important market. So I do believe that at the midterm, it might have an impact in our region. Reforms are a big thing. A big problem. Uh, the professor said something in Brazil, in my country. I believe the reforms could have been made in a better moment. It's not good to make reforms in the middle of a, an issue. Then you use uh, the calm times to do reforms. Uh, fiscal, election, education, all of these are very difficult for the uh, entrepreneurs in Brazil. So we need to be resilient and insist so that these changes do take root. We do have to respect the agreements and um, um, legal safeties, but it's necessary to correct uh, uh, directions both in Brazil and in the world. The average aid and for of, um, retirement, Brazil has changed 20 years to now. So they are living longer, so this needs to be changed. And I respect what my, we have to respect acquired right. The hashtag Latam Grow, the AN Latam, que es un, un statement, dice, un país protect is a particular uh, country brings to be isolated, and it could be uh, to Brazil. Another question? Or any comments? Good afternoon, Latin America. Uh, the majority of countries has uh, been agreed with the Council of Washington. And uh, before this example that developed countries are putting to us that they didn't follow the rules and now they have problems, what is the temptation? How to, to manage that temptation in making the same mistakes that they did? 
now in Latin America. How, how did you uh, supposed to behave before that? I am bringing this topic because uh, Mexico uh, uh, increased the deficit, and uh, now the economy is growing less, so the deficit is growing uh, more and more, and it, um, it have a tendency of the trend to go back to the same thing. So, uh, so I would like to, to hear your comments. Basically, I would say the following. I am very, have been very vigilant of these situations. And one of the ways that it has been changed is from the left to the right. The, the country requires uh, some discipline the, to manage the public finances and the, the central bank. They are elements, they are very uh, important elements. The, what you're saying about the, 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 the budget in 2014 is that when you have a fiscal reform that is uh, towards reforms, and you have an economy like 2013 with 1% decrease, uh, that you have to develop a new economic or the economical agents are, the goal could be to have viable, to have anti-cyclical uh, policies. And you can see how the, the, the qualifying factors have been there. A very brief uh, comments at some, the words. Yeah. In the past, we actually refused ALCA because of an excessive protectionism by part of the Brazilian industry, which is now over with. So protectionism, what it does is it makes inefficiency de facto, and then you start isolating yourself, and you stop participating in all the chains of production over the world. So I'd like to give an example. Farm Bill approved recently, last month. We're looking at a law that's very protectionist, where productivity is not being prioritized. We're going to produce with or without productivity, and productors are going to be uh, Rewarded. In the second fila. Buenas tardes, Natividad. De Panama, from Panama. You mentioned in that uh, Ricardo says that the businesses are looking uh, or uh, abilities is the the way of thinking uh, with the young when they're going to look for jobs they find. Uh, employers that they are just looking according to the career that you study and what is your experience, not according to the skills or capabilities or your profile. How can you find what they say, the balance between what they say and what exactly happens? I believe that the risk uh, one of the strategies that is fundamental and to apply in Latin America to facilitate the transition between the study and the experience of work because we have many people that they are looking jobs for the first time and the business is uh, it's hard for them to know what are the, the, the skills or the capabilities of those uh, people. I believe, I believe that it's fundamental to subsidize that transition. We can see that when our uh, young people graduate, they come from a good university and they spend two, one or two years uh, with no salaries. I think that that is a crime. I don't think that that should happen. But that what it means is that the market is not uh, does not want to pay for a person that doesn't have uh, experience. I think that the, 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 the business should be compensated to be training those people and to keep, and those qualifications should be qualified as they do it in Germany. I think that is very important to integrate the private sector to the formation of the younger people, to learn from those uh, businesses, to, to be in those businesses that it has a market value and the businesses would like to be more attractive to have that uh, possibility. Ricardo Hasman from the uh, the Canadian School, Ildefonso, Minister of Economy, Fran de Lima, Minister of Panama, Finance Minister, Brian Smith, uh, President of Coca-Cola, and Casibro, uh, Senator from Brazil. Thank you to you all. 
I think we have resolved all the problems of Latin America for 30 or 40 years, and we have done it in 45 minutes. And thank you very much to all of you to follow with the questions for the comments uh, by Twitter. And thank you very much to the ones that are at home following this program, a special program of Agenda from the city of Panama. Now we will be talking to the minister how we can stay in Panama on a permanent basis. It's, it's possible we will be here from Panama right here in Agenda. If not, we'll be in Berlin until next week. Gracias.